Have you ever wondered what will happen when Jesus takes the church out of the world? How will those who are left behind hear the gospel? Well, according to our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, God never leaves himself without a witness. And that's what we'll hear today on Through the Bible. I'm Steve Schwetz, your host for this five-year journey through God's entire Word, and I'm so glad that you've hopped aboard the Bible bus as we travel the pages of Revelation chapter 7, verses 5 through 12. Before we jump right into our study, though, I'm excited to share a few letters from our fellow Bible bus passengers. The first is from Marie, who writes to us from her home in Oregon. I cannot emphasize enough how much of a blessing it is to have your program at my fingertips. Some days on my commute, I can only catch the listener's letters at the beginning, but that is often the best part. So many have brought me to tears, and it is thrilling to hear how people around the globe have been impacted by God's Word through your ministry. I have ordered the five-year series flash drive, and it's helped in my studies. I have been listening now for 15 plus years, and you have seen me through raising a very troubled teenage daughter and a kindergarten-aged twin daughters while going through a very difficult divorce and ongoing court cases. As difficult as it has been, through it all, God has indeed been faithful, gracious, and merciful. Today, my three beautiful daughters believe in his name. My past troubled teen is now a wonderful, very strong mother of two. I am now remarried and have two wonderful stepsons and extended family. My husband and I pray not only for the salvation of all of our five children and six grandchildren, but also that they recognize and live their godly purpose. Thank you for all you do, and I know you will be in my life for many, many years to come. Well, thanks so much, Marie. Thanks for sharing the story of of God's faithfulness in your life, and thank you for joining us each day on Through the Bible. Our next letter comes from another mother and wife who listens this time to our Hindi broadcast in Uttar Pradesh, India. She writes, I used to worship several gods, hoping to live a life of peace and prosperity. I am blessed with a husband and two children, but one day I fell seriously ill and was unable to care for them. There were no treatments or medicines that could cure me. I began to lose all hope. Around five years ago, my husband happened to tune the radio to your program when the preacher was speaking from Matthew 6, chapters 25 to 27. I learned God was in control of all things, and he loved mankind so much, he gave up his only son to take the punishment of our sins. As the preacher continued to explain more from the book of Matthew, he spoke about the famous verse, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all things shall be added to you. At the end of the program, I joined the preacher in prayer, and I decided to continue listening to the program every day, as it left me with a peace I couldn't understand or explain. The following day, the preacher spoke from Matthew 7, and the verse, Ask, and it will be given to you. It made me immediately go to my knees, weep before Christ, and ask Him for His healing on my life. Within a week, I slowly began to notice some improvement in my health. Today, by the grace of God, I am much better, and more importantly, my entire family has accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord, and we are listening to you regularly. Well, praise God. That's a great story of God's redeeming power, isn't it? Marie, hopefully you shed a tear with that one. Our last letter comes from a listener of our Indonesian program. He writes, I praise God for your program that helps me to know Him. My life is consumed by worry, and as you speak, I begin to relax because I know the Lord will protect me from dangerous situations. Please keep teaching as God's Word is the only thing that gets me through each day. Well, we know this listener isn't alone, that's for sure. Are you worried about today? Well, as we've been traveling through the great book of Revelation, has your heart been burdened by What's to become of this world? It is a scary time in which we live. Well, listen to Dr. McGee read an interesting poem about worry, and then we'll join him in prayer for our study. Now, for the benefit of those of you that feel like the book of Revelation is a book that's so mysterious and that as you read it, it worries you, and you look at the world today, and there's utter confusion in your thinking. May I say to you that Someone has sent me a little poem from Wisconsin, and we're going to begin our study today by reading it. And the title of the poem is, She Worries. She worries, it doesn't matter what or why. 
She doesn't even need to try. It's natural for this soul to cry. I'm worried. She worries about her friends who may be ill, about the storms that maim and kill, about the weather if it's chill. She's worried. She worries because the world's in such a mess, because the poor are penniless. She has forgotten God, I guess, and worries. And let's remember that even in the book of Revelation, the Lord Jesus Christ is the theme of this book. It's all about him. It's not about horses riding. It's not about beasts. It's not about Antichrist. It's not about even judgments on the earth. It's about the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you keep him before you, you're not going to worry too much, my friend, and the book will become meaningful to you. Now, we left off last time in the seventh chapter, and we put in today at verse 5. Shall we look to God in a word of prayer? Our gracious Father God, make real and living thy word to our hearts today, for we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Now, this very wonderful chapter answers the question of whether anyone's going to get saved in the great tribulation. And the facts are that it'll be probably the greatest period in the history of the world. That is, you could not find a similar period of the same time when this many people were saved. And we have called attention to the fact that the Holy Spirit left the world to present the church to Christ, but he's back in the world doing the same thing he did before the day of Pentecost. And when somebody says the Holy Spirit is not here, well, my answer is, where did he go? Because he never did leave. He's omnipresent, and the church was taken out of the world, and we were sealed until the day of redemption, the church is, and he'll see that the church gets into the presence of Christ, and then he continues his ministry, which has always been one of taking God's creation and renovating it. And the Spirit of God, we're told at the beginning, brooded over the waters, and the Spirit of God broods over this earth today and has from the very beginning and will after the church is removed from the earth. We saw that there are two great companies that are saved, and we just got a glimpse at the first company, and it was of the children of Israel. And when it says children of Israel, it doesn't mean any other people than Israel. And the interesting thing is the numbers given, 144,000, and they're out of 12 tribes. He's going to give it in detail of the tribes. And I want to read to you now, beginning with verse 5, read down through verse 8. It says, of the tribe of Judah were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Reuben, 12,000. Tribe of Gad, 12,000. Tribe of Asher, 12,000. Tribe of Naphtali, 12,000. Tribe of Manasseh, 12,000. Tribe of Simeon, 12,000. Tribe of Levi, 12,000. Of the tribe of Issachar, 12,000. Tribe of Zebulun, 12,000. Of the tribe of Joseph, 12,000. Of the tribe of Benjamin were sealed, 12,000. Now, 12,000 out of each tribe, so that the 144,000 are divided by 12, and one twelfth is in each tribe, so that we know we're talking about the children of Israel. I don't see how anyone can spiritualize this and attempt to appropriate either to themselves or to some other group than the children of Israel, because God had promised, as we've seen again and again in the Old Testament, that he would bring them through this time of trouble, this great day of the Lord, and he would come and establish the kingdom, which we're going to see is first a thousand-year kingdom, for it's a time of testing, and then it moves right into eternity. We have here, given these 12 tribes, and one writer says there 13 times in the Bible that the 12 tribes are given. And another writer says 18. I don't know which it is. I frankly didn't feel like that was worthwhile determining. 
But in every case where the 12 tribes are given, it's always 12 tribes. Now, sometimes changes are made, and I can't always determine what the change is. I can in some cases, but in some, I'm not always clear in my own thinking. But I know God had something in mind when he did. Now, there are these peculiarities here, and I'm going to call attention to them, and I hope this is not nitpicking. I think it's important and significant, but I don't think it's essential to go into detail concerning these 12 tribes. Now, first of all, you will notice that Judah heads the list. The tribe of Reuben should come first, for Reuben was the oldest. But because of his sin, and if you want to check on that sin, it's back in Genesis, the 49th chapter, verse 4. And because of that very gross immorality on the part of Reuben, he lost first place, but he didn't lose out. Now, the question arises, when a Christian sins, does he lose his salvation? No, but he may lose his reward. Very frankly, there'll be many Christians that they're saved, but they indulged in sin, and they'll lose their reward. And Reuben here is a very good example of how God deals, and this principle is set down here. Reuben lost first place. He lost the place of honor, but he didn't lose out altogether because he's given here, but he's number two. He should have been number one. And it was from the tribe of Judah that the Lord Jesus came. Then we find here that the tribes of Dan and Ephraim were omitted from this list. Both of these tribes were guilty of going into idolatry. Now, I'm not going to take time again for this because I don't want to go into too much detail, but if you would turn to Deuteronomy, the 29th chapter, verses 18 through 21, you would find that the tribe of Dan went into idolatry and the tribe of Ephraim because there in Moses' great prophecy, why that is mentioned Then in history, you will find that Dan was the first tribe that fell into idolatry. Now, that's found in Judges, the 18th chapter, verse 30. And very frankly, the tribe of Dan became later on the headquarters for calf worship because we're told Jeroboam made Israel to sin. And that's found in 1 Kings, the 12th chapter, 28 to 30. They are given top priority in the millennium. And in Ezekiel, the 48th chapter, you will find out that the tribe of Dan is in the millennium, but they weren't sealed for the time of the great tribulation. And that reveals that the grace of God can reach down and meet the need of any sinner. And though they were not sealed for the purpose of witnessing, and I think, again, this tribe lost out a great deal. Now, Ephraim was also guilty of idolatry. Many of you will recall not too long ago when we studied Hosea that Ephraim was given over to idols. In fact, the matter is, God says, Let him alone because of the fact he had turned and had gone into idolatry. I think probably I will turn and read that verse. It's found in the fourth chapter, verse 17 of Hosea. Ephraim is joined to idols. Let him alone. Now, that has reference to the northern kingdom, but remember that Ephraim was the leader there. And Ephraim was the tribe which led in the division of the kingdom in 1 Kings eleven twenty six. And now in this list, Joseph takes the place of Ephraim. And we have to take the place of Dan, Levi. And I think the reason that Levi is given is because Levi was the priestly tribe and they are going to be witnesses in the great tribulation period. And it's quite proper for them to be witnesses in the great tribulation period. Now, I trust that we can understand and see here 
that now God has turned again to the nation Israel. He'd not given them up. He'd said to Ephraim, Oh, Ephraim, how can I give thee up? God says, I can't do it. And God didn't give them up. They are going to make it through the great tribulation period, even though they lost out as witnesses for God during that period. The 144,000 are sealed, especially because they're going to witness during this period. And it's going to cost them a great deal. And if they weren't sealed, they sure wouldn't be able to make it through. You see, God never leaves himself without a witness on this earth. Now we have brought before us another company of redeemed. It's a redeemed multitude of Gentiles. Now I'm going to read verses 9 through 10. And I'm going to read them in my translation, which I do not recommend, but we're going to get at the literal here. Will you listen to this? After these things I saw, and remember, he is seeing as well as hearing at this particular place. After these things I saw, and behold, a great multitude which no man could number. Now, someone says... uh, You mean to tell me that men couldn't count that crowd? Well, it doesn't say that. It says no one man could number these. And it doesn't say anything about a computer or an IBM machine. But it says no one man could number this crowd because it's such a large crowd. And I wouldn't dare to venture any number whatsoever. But it must be a very large crowd, or they could be numbered, which no man could number. Out of every nation and out of tribes and peoples and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb, arrayed in white robes and palm branches in their hands, and they cry with a great voice, saying, The salvation to our God who sitteth on the throne and to the Lamb. Now, obviously, the size of this multitude is stupendous. It's not a one-man job to number them. And these are Gentiles, people from every tribe and nation under the sun. That means that the gospel of the kingdom and the great tribulation will be preached throughout the world. I want to repeat this. The witnesses, these 144,000 in the Great Tribulation period are going to do in seven years what the church up to the present has not done in 1900 years. So don't boast about your missionary program. None of us are reaching too many. But during the Great Tribulation, there'll be a great company of people. Now, I personally want to add this, and it's my own private judgment, and you can take it for what it's worth, which is not very much. But I do believe that before the church leaves, and I don't think he says it anywhere, because nothing has to be fulfilled before he removes the church, but it looks to me like now he's going to let the world hear the gospel before the rapture of the church. And I believe that radio is one of the mediums that will be used. I think there are other mediums that are being used today that are fantastic. The tape ministry. Our tape ministry now almost equals our radio ministry, the printed page. And then the evangelism today. Many evangelists are just reaching multitudes of people today. And Other radio programs are doing a much bigger job than we're doing. But you put us all together, we're making quite an impact on this world in which we live. Now, here is a great company that have come out of the Great Tribulation period. This great company, they are rejoicing in their salvation. And they've been saved during the Great Tribulation period. And again, may I say, the greatest days of God's salvation are in the future. And they're standing before the throne and before the Lamb. And that indicates that they are redeemed. 
and it indicates they've made it through the Great Tribulation period. Now, the white robes here set before us the righteousness of Christ in which they're clothed because we couldn't stand before God in our own righteousness, our own righteousness of filthy rags. And I don't think you're going to have filthy rags in the presence of God. And the palm branches here, literally in the Greek, that's palm trees. And that is the sign of victory, victory in Christ. This multitude is part of that great triumphal entry when Christ returns to the earth. Really, the triumphal entry has never taken place. That actually was more like a triumphal exit. When he came into Jerusalem, he's getting ready to leave, you see, the earth, because he was on the way to the cross at that time. But since then, might has been a great company. And in the Great Tribulation, there's going to be another great company And when he returns to the earth, this great company that were martyred for him, that died for him in the great tribulation, and we're going to see later on there, included in the first resurrection, they're going to be there. Now, this is a wonderful, glorious picture that's given to us. Now, notice verses 11 and 12, and I'll read them in my translation. And all the angels were standing around the throne and about the elders, and the four living creatures. And they fell before the throne on their faces and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be under our God forever and ever. You know, this is a fabulous, fantastic scene that's before us here. This universal worship of God by his creatures and the angels join in on it. The church is here. The Old Testament saints are here. And these are different companies. And the tribulation saints are here. And now the angels join this. Now, there are just one or two things I'd like to say about the angels, and I don't want to labor the point and I wouldn't contend with anybody about it. But you know, nowhere in Scripture does it say that angels sing. And I like that because I can't sing either, but I'm no angel. But the point is, I think I'm going to stand with them. They're saying this here. Now, I'm not going to contend with you. If you think angels sing, you just keep right on thinking it. It's perfectly all right. But the important thing to note here, and this is important, the other company... They thank God for their redemption, (laughs) the salvation of our God. (laughs) But the angels don't mention it. Well, why don't they mention it? Well, they praise God for his attributes and goodness, but not for salvation. Why? They are sinless creatures, not redeemed sinners. And I don't think they're going to be able to sing. But I do believe Vernon McGee will be able to sing in that day. I can't do it now, but I sure will be able to sing with that great company. Friends, I hope that this will begin to broaden your vision and your comprehension of what heaven's going to be. A great many people think that the only folk going to be in heaven is their little group, their little church, or their little denomination. Well, my friends, there are going to be other redeemed people there besides even the church. I think that's going to surprise a lot of the saints to discover that when they get to heaven. I wish we could discover it down here. It would give us, I think, a greater love for God and lead us to worship him more in a very real way. Worship him in spirit and truth today. Our time is up. So until next time, may God richly bless you, my beloved. These messages in Revelation are incredible, don't you think? Well, if you've missed a study, you can always visit our website at ttb.org, where you can listen to or download them anytime, or download one of our apps and listen on demand. And if you'd like to expand your study of Revelation, why don't you check out Dr. McGee's free MP3 series called Reveling Through Revelation and his digital book, God's Grand Finale and Introduction to Revelation. In it, you'll be introduced to four systems of understanding Revelation— 
six striking and unique features of the book, and review the ten principles of prophecy that find their fulfillment for all time within its pages. But ultimately, Dr. McGee reminds us that despite the bizarre images and important symbols, Revelation is about Jesus and God's intention and purpose for him to reign through eternity. It's a great introduction for diving deep into a study of this often misunderstood but oh-so-important book. So don't wait. Why don't you get a free digital copy at ttb.org, or you can always call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE. Again, that's 1-800-65-BIBLE or ttb.org. Well, that's all for today. I'm Steve Schwetz. So grateful for your company on the Bible bus and your partnership in taking God's whole word to his whole world. Jesus made it all, all to be my own. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Through the Bible is a five-year study of God's entire Word, and together we discover God's purposes in history and our lives, found only when we believe in Jesus Christ. Do you know Him yet?